and we're live. James, how are you? You good. I'm good. How are you doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. Hi, everyone. Uh, Hugo and James here from, from Coiled. Um, love for you to introduce, your, or, uh, introduce yourself in, in the chat. Let us know who you are, where you work, what you're up to, your interest in DAS, your interest in Coiled. All of that would be fantastic. Um, James, maybe you could, I could introduce you, but maybe you could introduce yourself, but maybe actually I should before that introduce Coiled and just for all of you who um, ha haven't heard of us or interested in, 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 in we're up to, uh, what we're up to, um, we uh, build a, a service, a, a product and a, a project um, that allows you to have your scalable Python uh, environments and clusters at, at the click of a button. So it's massively scalable Python as a, uh, as a service um, based around the wonderful project Dask, which we all which we all know and love here, which perhaps talking about Coil and Dask is actually a wonderful introduction to the two sides of, of, of James, right? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Hugo. Uh, so yeah, I'm a uh, Dask maintainer along with uh, a lot of other uh, open source contributors. And yeah, I'm also a software engineer um, at Coiled working on both uh, the uh, project we'll show today as well as like some Dask services as well. Get help letting, helping people uh, use Dask effectively. Um, what's it like? And we haven't prepped this, so feel free to d divert if some of these, if I'm asking the tough sure. questions already. What's it like being an open source software project maintainer and be starting a company which projectizes or productizes and also monetizes said project? Is, is there some wow. sort of cognitive dissonance there or? I'm. Uh... Super happy we didn't prep this beforehand, Hugo. That's great. Um, <laughs> no, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I would be more torn about it. Uh, so, so yeah, like I'm I'm all for the free and open source um, projects, and in particular Dask. Um, I'm I'm less torn about it because we're actually building sort of infrastructure around Dask. Not uh, you know we're not trying to charge for Dask. We're trying mm. to uh, build uh, projects around it um, that help help people. Um, I also like that. Uh, right now, at least, we'll talk about this later. But uh, there's a free portion or a free a free version of uh, Coiled, which also I like that aspect as well. Absolutely, so it, it truly is accessible for everyone. I I couldn't agree more. And it's funny that we really haven't delved into this this side of the conversation yeah. so much before. We'll, we'll jump into what we're here for very soon. But I I totally agree with that. I also think the team, um, you know, working with Matt and and Rami and a lot of other people um, who. Uh, very much engaged and part of the open source community and figuring out how to how to meet enterprise needs with open source technology. Um, and also just spreading the love of Dask and open source and the Pi, Pi data stack. The way I, I think about it as well is um, that we're building tools that make OSS stuff even more accessible to individuals and, and enterprise. Um, yeah, totally. So just one, one other like quick bullet point there is like, Coiled pays me in part to like work on open source tasks, which is great. Yeah. And like as a company, we have a like financial incentive to make sure the pro the project, gas the project is like, you know, a good project and, and works for people in all all walks of life. So yep. anyway, that's just one one other bullet point on there. Thank you. Um, so can you remind us all what Dask is? And while we're while you're doing that, I'm actually going to share the notebook we'll be working from. Um, in, in the chat here as well. So people can oh, sure. put along or check it out. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Dask is a uh, free and open source uh, Python library for, for scalable computing. Uh, we'll see an action in, in this notebook in a little bit. Um, but yeah, it, it reuses a lot of familiar um, APIs like the NumPy and Pandas API. Um, second Learns API. So it, it really interacts with the well with the uh, PyData ecosystem that you hopefully already know and love. Um, so yeah, that's what Dask is in, in my mind. Awesome. Um, well, maybe without further ado, we can we can jump in. I've shared shared the notebook. Sure. Maybe you can just while you're opening it, give us a brief idea of of what we'll be covering today. Yeah, totally. Um, let me share my screen real quick. Can you see, yeah. hopefully not my desktop with all of its uh, things saved, but a separate screen with the terminal? Correct. Science Great. Thursday coiled. Cool. That's us. Yes, that is us. Cool, dude. Um, so uh, I guess one thing I wanted to point out real quick is that like I am on, everything I'm running is is on my laptop. I, I have Mac and you know I'm, I'm sitting here um, on some 
repo on my desktop. So, I'm and this is not this recorded. This is live demoing at its at its finest. This, yeah, uh, for better or worse, uh, we'll see what we are in for. <laughs> We're, we are doing it live, that is for sure. Um, so yeah, I, I have a notebook here. Where have you got to maximize? Sure. The, yeah, yeah. The the text a bit. Yep. That, let me. Uh, I'm gonna want to make this smaller later, but like for now, is this is this good? Yep, that's great. Okay. And if anyone out there, if there's anybody out there, and you and you can't see it, just let us know in the chat as well. Cool. Um, yeah, so Hugo shared the, the link to the repo where this notebook uh, lives. So yeah, you can uh, go check that out if you like. Um, the goal for this talk is to, I've, I've sort of outlined what we're gonna cover here. We're gonna give like a brief introduction to Dask. It, it is brief, um, just a fair warning. Um, then we're gonna introduce Coiled and kind of like what, what are the things Coiled does? Like what, what kind of does it offer you? Um, and then we're gonna, as part of that, we're gonna spin up a Dask cluster in AWS using Coiled. Um, create some custom software environments. And then like, yeah, definitely along the way, we're gonna answer any questions you have. Feel free to comment in the YouTube uh, channel. Um, Hugo or someone can answer them there or relay them to me, however, however we end up doing that. Um, yeah, and kind of the, the overall goal is to, um, for you to have an, an understanding of what Coiled is, what it does, and then maybe more importantly, how to get started with Coiled if you want to. Um, so yeah, with, with that, let's, go to the first sort of portion of, of this, which is what is Dask? Um, so I'm, I'm linking the documentation here. Like I said, it is a, a brief overview. Um, but yeah, uh, as I mentioned before, it's a uh, Python library for uh, parallel and distributed computing. Um, like I said, it, it reuses a lot of familiar APIs. Uh, so it, it doesn't really try and reinvent a lot of things. Dask code oftentimes looks and feels a lot like other you might write with NumPy or Pandas as we'll see. Um, it also like, it, it integrates well with the uh, PyData ecosystem. So there are a lot of projects out there that um, uh, have, have built functionality on top of Dask or somehow incorporated Dask into their projects. These are projects like X-Array, uh, the Rapids project, uh, XGBoost. Um, actually XGBoost just added uh, support for, for Dask uh, natively inside XGBoost before there is a separate package for that. That's um, so cool. Yeah, We've had yeah. a request if you could yeah. just zoom in one more. Oh, zoom in one more. Oh yeah, totally. Yep. Is that, um, okay, that was one more. Let me know if I need to keep zooming. Um, let's let's do one yeah. more. May as well just go one one further. <laughs> okay. And and I just wanted to, to add, um, you, you mentioned that one of the most important things that Dask really works really well with a, a lot of the PyData Pi data stuff. And I, I think a historical note on that is it actually, you know, was, it sprung out of PyData stuff, right? It was a lot of people totally. um, at, at Continual Manaconda at, at the time thinking about how to do scalable data science with pandas and all, all, all of these things. Yeah. So it was it kind like, of how do we do, how do, we do NumPy? Yeah, yeah. How do we do a scalable NumPy in parallel? That yeah. was the origin story. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So shout out to um, Anaconda and all, all the folks there who did a lot of really work on, on yeah. that. And, sort of and the Pi data in, in general, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, Okay. And then, yeah, kind of the last like bullet point here, and this is super nice is, is Dask works on a single machine as we'll see here, but it also scales out to uh, distributed environments and multiple machines. That's, that's really nice because you can use the same tool Dask like through that whole spectrum of, uh, of hardware. So it's, not, it's nice that you, you, you don't have to like run something on your laptop and you're like, oh, I want to like kind of scale this up. Um, I have to switch to using a different tool. Now. You can use Dask the whole way through. Um, and one of the more important parts of Dask is the Dask uh, is, is a Dask cluster. This is where you'll actually be executing all of these tasks in parallel. So, here's sort of a, a sketch of the the main components of the Dask cluster. So there's a Dask client, and like you'll you'll be dealing with the Dask client. Um, I have a little Python and Jupyter here. Like wherever you are running, like that's like the user facing entry point. So um, we will create a client here in this Jupyter Lab uh, notebook. Um, it, you might be doing it in a script or something like that. It's sort of the user facing entry point to the cluster. Um, the client then connects to uh, a Dask scheduler process. Um, what you do is you use the client to submit tasks to the scheduler and the scheduler keeps track of like a bunch of state. Um, like what tasks do you want me to compute? Uh, like what, what have you submitted to the cluster? Kind of all the dependencies. Like you want me to compute this, but in order to do that, I have to compute these three things beforehand. It'll keep track of like that ordering um, and, and what's currently being executed, what's done being executed. Um, and it'll, it'll farm off all of those 
tasks that you'd like to compute to uh, worker nodes in the, in the cluster. Um, so there's a single central scheduler. And then in this picture, I just have three, but you can have you know, thousands of Dask workers uh, uh, flying around. And those are where the actual work happens, where you actually compute the tasks. Um, and yeah, that's, that's sort of the, the lay of the land for what a Dask cluster is. So single scheduler, many workers in the client. I should say like these can all run in, any, in many different places. These can kind of run wherever you can run Python. So like, for instance, um, you can run all of these on your laptop. You can run the client and then the scheduler and worker processes on your laptop. We'll do that in a second. You can also run the workers and scheduler somewhere else. Like you could run them, uh, like we will also later run workers and schedulers on AWS. So, so the client will still be on my laptop, but I'll just be talking to a cluster that lives on, remotely on AWS. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the synopsis there. Let's maybe see Dask in action. So um, one of the easiest way to spin up uh, one of these clusters uh, is it, sort of built straight into Dask. So we can, uh, from Dask.distributed, import a local cluster and then this client object I was talking about. Um, so what a local cluster will do is when you instantiate it, it'll create all of these things for you, meaning the scheduler and the worker processes. Let's just do that, that real quick. Um, so here I'm spinning up this Dask cluster with all these workers and the scheduler, but it's all on my laptop locally. So here you can see, um, you, you can choose how many workers and like there's a lot of keyword arguments to go in here, but by default, it just chooses the number of workers equals to the number of cores you have. Um, I have four cores on my laptop, so I have uh, four workers. Each worker has two threads. That's where we're getting this number eight here. And you can see my whole cluster all together has like uh, 17 gigabytes of, of memory. Um, yeah, and then there's, you can then connect. So that's, that's the cluster part. So that's the scheduler and workers. And then I can go ahead and connect a client to it as well. Um, you can connect a client to this cluster by just passing the, the cluster object here um, into the client when you instantiate it. And now you can see uh, I've, I've got my scheduler address. Notice it's like at localhost, it's running locally alongside the dashboard. Um, that's another really nice thing that I didn't talk about that Dask has, which is these diagnostics. Um, Hugo, I'm gonna try and do this kind of like side by side. Hopefully okay. I don't have to make text smaller. I think that's okay. I think that's still good. Um, that looks okay. good to me. And if anyone in the in the um, YouTube wants to let us know, yeah, they want to know. Go, feel free to let us Things know. Things need to change. Um, yeah, so th these diagnostics are, are great. Uh, they give you like lots of insight into what's actually happening on the cluster. So let's go ahead and actually run something. So um, I'm gonna execute this cell. This is what I mean by um, uh, Dask uh, implements like familiar APIs. So there's a Dask data frame module, which is sort of like a parallel version of Pandas. So here we're doing a read CSV um, on some CSV, a single CSV file on S3. We're kind of breaking it up into different chunks so we can process it in parallel. Um, and then we're doing some group by operation. Uh, this particular data set is a, um, uh, like some simulation for uh, uh, detect, it's a collider physics simulation for, for Higgs bosons. Uh, I have a physics background and thought this would be relevant. Um, and science yeah, does that. We, and what is, what is more science than, yes. than the Higgs boson? There we go. Exactly. Um, so yeah, we do, we group by tables. We, do some aggregate, we get the missing energy, which happens to be a column here. We take the mean and compute it. And then we can see these are, this is all running on my laptop. So like the reason this is kind of taking a while is because we can see these read CSVs happening. Like Dask is going off to uh, AWS and S3, like getting the data, sort of bringing it back, doing some computation. Um, but the important thing to note is this all looks really similar to exactly what you do with pandas, except we just did it on a cluster running on my laptop. You can see at the end, I get some aggregate uh, group by information here. So I guess the take home point is like, this is awesome. We can do larger than memory computations um, using Dask. So we can start analyzing data sets that wouldn't normally fit into memory on my laptop, say. Um, the, uh, and, and it does this all using like familiar APIs. Like this code looks much like, like Pandas code. Um, and what we've been using so far is a plus to my laptop. So like I said, like I have, I have you know, four workers, I have uh, 17 gigs of memory. Like eventually you'll, you'll start analyzing uh, data sets where you'll want more computational resources. So how do you, how do you then start to scale beyond your, your own local hardware and, on whatever machine you're running on? Um, putting on my, my open source uh, community hat, uh, there are several projects for this in the Dask ecosystem uh, that aren't coiled. Um, so uh, there are, and these are all for deploying Dask clusters on different types of hardware you, you may have access to. 
So if, uh, I link here, I kind of list a few of them and link here to their documentation. There's Dask Kubernetes for deploying on Kubernetes clusters. Uh, if you have a Yarn access to a Yarn cluster, you can use Dask Yarn. If you have access to some HPC job queuing system like uh, Slurm or HD Condor, you can use uh, Dask job queue, et cetera. If you have like MPI things around, you can use Dask MPI. Um, these are great because like this is um, in the Dask ecosystem and we have technology to deploy Dask clusters um, on these different types of hardware. That's like the great thing about these projects. Um, the, the downside to these projects is sort of like the, the caveat is that um, a lot of the times using these projects require either having access to like, for instance, an HPC job queuing system somewhere or um, uh, manually kind of setting up that infrastructure yourself. So like, for instance, you might go uh, make an AWS account, go spin up um, a Kubernetes cluster and then use Dask Kubernetes to uh, uh, run Dask on that cluster. Um, that requires like a deeper knowledge of the actual hardware or like whatever system you're using to, to run Dask on. So like, for instance, like you would, to, to do that, you would need to know um, about AWS IAM rules. You need to know like how to set them up, like what permissions you need. Um, you know, if you work on a team, you might find yourself then like other people wanting to to also uh, use that cluster. And then you're like, like starting to manage more things um, and you're starting to manage like a lot of infrastructure that um, you you may or may not be able to or, or want to do. Um, so, so yeah. You have a question, a James. Of, this is, yeah, this yeah. is all, these are all very, I think, important um, examples and things to, to note that are ways to do this. Um, I almost have decision fatigue already thinking about the bunch of the variety of different options. Um, Olgias has a question. If I have an AWS EKS cluster up and running, should I look into Dask Kubernetes or Dask Cloud Provider? Before I get you to answer that, I, I would say you should also look into Coiled Cloud, absolutely. And we're gonna go through that today because you don't even ha have to worry about in, any of this setup. But James, um, in lieu of using Coiled Cloud, what, what would you suggest, Dask Kubernetes or Dask Cloud? Provider? Yeah, I, I would look into Dask Kubernetes for that. Yep. Okay, um, fantastic. Yeah. For 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 in in any case, if a Kubernetes cluster up and running on on AWS. Yep. Great. Um, yeah, and they, they should list all the permissions and stuff you need um, to to do that. Um, yeah. Okay. Great question. Thank you. Um, yeah. So there is like, it does require some either access or to these uh, to this infrastructure or setting this up yourself or having some sort of like deep understanding, deep knowledge of the hardware you're running on. There are also like features and we'll run into some examples here that kind of aren't covered by these projects. Things like software, like managing your software environments for you is like a common thing that that users will run into when they start uh, using, I guess, Dask, but generally speaking, like distributed systems and we'll run into that. Um, and even and generally that, that getting stuff kind of, in production or sharing, I mean, in all honesty, yeah. nearly every like data scientist I've met has like had at least one nightmare in their life about like woken up Sure. worried about their software environments, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, their software environments are like, you know, like I don't want to spend, or I, I may not want to spend um, all day like setting up, you know, network security, things like that. Um, and like, if you have an IT team or like a DevOps team, like that's awesome. You should like take full advantage of that. But there are lots of people who don't have access to those um, types of yeah, resources. Yeah, I, I agree. And, so, but also on top of that, I, I think, if you do have a DevOps team, they're getting paid a significant amount of money, right? And is it sure. cost, cost efficient or do you want to, you know, use a service like, like Coiled or in any other number of services, right? Or do you want your DevOps yeah. team working on this all, all the time? Yeah, definitely cost benefit analysis there for sure. Um, yeah. I guess kind of summarizing, that's all to say that there, these projects do exist out there um, and they are great for some people in some situations. They are like, they've, they've been, they're tried and true, but they, they aren't, for everyone, that's that's the main point I wanted to uh, get across there. Um, so yeah, now putting on my coiled hat, that brings us to coiled. So, and before uh, we go on with coiled, I'm just going to have a little, um, let's say, uh, an advertising break from our sponsor, which is coiled in in in, in fact. Um, and if you are interested in Dask, if, if everyone out there, I just wanted to let you know we are we're, we're running a Dask training in in, in December mm -hmm. with um, the head of head of training uh, Adam uh, at Coiled. Uh, and both Matt Rothen and I may pop in to say hi um, and um, t teach a few things. But I'm gonna, the, the reason I'm, I'm advertising this, I'm gonna put the link here and just let you know that um, because, you know, joining Science Thursdays, we're, we're so grateful and consider you um, friends of Coiled uh, immediately, where I'm gonna put in a 20% off coupon 
coupon code that will be valid until the end of end of October if you want to join um, this uh, this training. Have a look at look at that and, and and let us know what you think as well. Um, and if there are other things in in Dask that you'd you'd like to learn about, always always reach out. Um, end advertising break. Continue coiled. After that word from our sponsor. Yeah, yeah, I didn't realize there, there were ads in, uh, on YouTube streaming. That's cool. Um, uh, it beats the YouTube ads, right? It, it does. Like, we don't need to talk about it, but like, yeah, it's, it's, it's election <laughs> season. There are ads every, anyways, yeah, it's, oh, it's, it's yeah. good to, yeah, yeah. No, it's good to, I'd much awesome. rather sit together. Um, okay, great. So yeah, so, so Coiled, um, I link here to the docs. I'll have like a list of links at the end as well, um, relevant links. But Coiled is a deployment as a service um, project for scaling Python. It, it consists of like a Python API, which we'll, we'll use a bunch uh, here, and also a web interface, which we'll, we'll kind of be going back and forth between this Jupyter session and uh, the, the web interface. So like from a high level Coiled, kind of like the buckets that Coiled of things that Coiled provides, I kind of group into these three categories. Um, easily launchable uh, cloud-based DAS clusters. We'll spin one up in just, uh, just a minute. Um, so launching DAS clusters, also managing software environments for you. That's like the second thing. That's like a big, um, a big uh, pain point for, for users um, when in distributed computing. Um, so we try and take care of that for you. We also have tools for collaborating and uh, tracking costs as well. Um, so at the top, I just want to kind of put this link here. If you go to cloud.coil.io, right now we are in a uh, public beta. It's totally free. You're uh, free to uh, join the beta. Uh, at there, cloud.coil.io. Um, I just kind of want to reiterate, while Coil is in beta, it's totally free to use. So you can, you will not be charged for any like resource, computational resources or any like clusters you spin up and you can use up to a hundred running uh, cores concurrently. So at any given time, you can be running a hundred cores. Um, so yeah, that's just like important point, free. Uh, there we go. Uh, so yeah, I link here to our getting started guide with Coiled. I'm just going to kind of briefly get started with it locally. So there, to, to actually like get Coiled set up and running, you get to you, you need to install Coiled. Um, you can do that on Conda Forge if you use Conda. If you use pip, you can install from PyPI. And then you need to run this Coiled login command locally. So I will do that real quick. Uh, so I'm just going to do that locally. Let me maybe blow this text up to make that kind of equivalent. Um, OK, cool. So Science Thursday, not SciPy 2019. OK, cool. Um, Cool. So I have, uh, I'm just going to use pip, pip install coiled. Um, I already have it installed, so it just kind of flew through there. Um, so you install coiled, and then you run coiled login. And what that's going to do is say, please log into like our, the coiled service uh, to get your token. So I'm going to click there. That takes me to, uh, I can blow that up also, make it a little bit bigger. Um, I also love that there's a there's a hyperlink in your terminal. Yeah, I mean that that's really it's, cool. Yeah, it's like nice, and if, if you're using iTerm, you can just kind of hover. It's it's nice to click on it. Um, yeah, so here's your token. I'm just going to copy my token to clipboard there, um, and then you go ahead and paste it in, and uh, it just like saved my token to a file. It told me where it is. Um, it uses Das config system under the hood. So you only have to do that coiled login step once at the very beginning, um, and and now now your computer is like good to go, uh, coiled. It has been uh, uh, like registered here. Okay, so that was it. That's how you set up Coiled. Um, and let's go ahead and actually spin up a cluster now. So this is how we spin up a cluster on Coiled. I'm going to just execute that. It'll it'll take a minute or so. Um, so I'm I'm using the time magic here. It'll just print out at the end how long it takes. So um, much like with the local cluster, how you just say like you instantiate a local cluster object with Das. Um, kind of going back to the top here. That's how I spin up a cluster locally on my laptop. With coiled, um, you instantiate a coiled.cluster object. I did pass in, um, I think it's maybe by default four. I just, I wanted more workers than four. So I, I said, give me 10 workers um, and uh, spin them up. So what this is doing under the hood is uh, making API calls to AWS and spinning up uh, 10, in this case, 10 workers and a scheduler. It's setting up uh, TLS security between, uh, between all the nodes in the cluster. Um, it's like, yeah, provisioning these resources. And that's, this takes a, a, like about a minute, two minutes, something like that on average. Um, and that's because we're just, you know, we're provisioning resources in a, on AWS. So it'll take a while. Maybe now's a good time to mention that like right now Coiled runs on AWS. You can launch 
uh, cloud-based clusters on in any region in AWS. Um, we there are more clouds like on the horizon. Um, most of the feedback or most of the early feedback we've gotten uh, indicates that like people want Azure support. So the next we're working on uh, uh, running Quail in Azure right now. Uh, GCP is also on the roadmap. That'll, that'll be coming at some point as well. Um, so that's yeah, so exciting. Then, I, 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 I got to say, go. James and, and everyone, I was I was super excited when I first saw that we can get a DAS cluster up and running on AWS without interacting with AWS. I, I, I think AWS is an incredible service. Having said that, there are certain things in AWS that are not so user friendly, I, I feel. Mm -hmm. um, and so being able to use it, set up a DAS cluster and having coiled uh, abstract over a AWS is such a huge win, I think. Yeah, yeah. So you can see that took uh, just under two minutes um, to, to spin up my cluster. Yeah, and like you could, also- I, You could I, make a cup of coffee in that time if you're lucky, right? Yeah, yeah. So like I conveyed, I, I inputted no AWS knowledge into this this cluster spinning up. I'm maybe going to go back to the web UI at this point. Um, so there's this clusters little tab over here and you can see, uh, I'll maybe widen this a little bit. You can see, um, so I've like spun up some clusters here. Uh, I have, this is the cluster that I'm, I'm cur that currently is running. If I click this little icon here, it'll show me the, the DAS dashboard. Um, right here. That's like what I was saying before. This has got some nice things. Like I can stop the cluster if I want over here. I actually really like this. Like this shows you all the logs for the, the cluster. So these are the dash logs from the scheduler, each of the workers. Yeah. It's like, that's, I mean, there's nothing like there right now than saying I've spun up and connected, but it's, it's super useful for debugging in particular. Um, also there's these cost monitoring. Uh, actually, you know what? We'll talk about that later. Um, it keeps track of costs. Like I said, it's free. This, you're not paying any money here. I, they don't have my credit card. It's just um, like, this is what it would cost if it wasn't free, basically. Um, cool. So I have my cluster spun up and you can see I've got my 10 workers I asked for. Um, they've each got four threads. You can adjust that, but that's like the default value. Um, or just, so I have, I have a total of 40 cores. Um, I didn't think about this, but I, I have roughly an order of magnitude more memory. Before on my laptop, I had 17 gigabytes. Now I have 171 gigabytes in my cluster. Um, so yeah, so now my cluster, the schedule and workers are off an AWS land. I'm now going to connect them to um, create a client that connects to that by uh, instantiating the, the same thing for the local cluster. You just pass it into the client object. Um, and notice that the scheduler and the dashboard are, are uh, living on EC2, like they're, they're in AWS land. So they, they are not actually running on my laptop. Um, there's this warning message here saying, this is just like baked into Dask. You'll see this often. If like certain packages have missed version mismatches, it will let you know. So like we can see, uh, like locally I have Dask uh, 2.30 installed, but like on the schedule of workers, I have Dask 2.29 installed. That's not a big deal, but it's like good to, it's good to know. That can sometimes be a big deal if there's like a breaking change between versions. Um, and we'll talk about this more in a minute too. But yeah, we just spun up a cluster. So now actually let's open up that uh, dashboard page. I'll get rid of the dashboard for my local cluster and uh, move that here. Let's do some stuff on uh, the cluster now. So I'm, I'm actually doing the same exact computation here that I did uh, before. I'm just doing it, uh, here we go. I'm just doing it on my cluster now. So you see, I have a lot more like bars here. I have more workers. Things are kind of moving faster. Um, machines are a little bit beefier. Um, but yeah, other than that, I'm doing the exact same computation. Um, if you don't, if you don't remember, before I was just analyzing a single CSV file. Here I'm reading in a bunch of CSV files. That's the main difference. So a lot larger data set, but everything else basically looks the same. And look at that. We just did like a group by aggregation on a DAS cluster, but it was on AWS. We were able to spin it up pretty easily. Um, yeah, so like, this is great. Let's like, take a take a moment to celebrate this moment uh, <laughs> that uh, we, we did this. Um, nice use of the Tada emoji as well. Yes. Big fan yes. of Tada. Hey, Thank can you, you just talk us through the task tree? What's, what's the red stuff? Uh, the red stuff is communication. Um, so like, if you're like, say a worker is, commu is computing some task, but like, it depends on the results of a few other tasks. There's some like dependencies, like compute this, then compute that. Um, Dask will move that dependency between workers. Uh, and that's whenever you see red here, that's what's happening. It's that, that mm. data transfer. Awesome. Thank you. And so I like just, generally, that's something you need to avoid. Yes. I, I just wanted to say woohoo one more time. And I, I feel like, let me get this right. Um, what you've done 
looks so easy that it's almost easy to to not recognize the, the achievement in, in, in a lot of ways. Like it looks so so straightforward, but you've actually done something which is is really, really challenging. Moving from your local environment, running an analysis, to getting up in a cloud, getting your dust cluster up and running, um, and getting the same analysis done on a on a larger data set. Um, and and I suppose what I want to say is that 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 is a great achievement, but you've you've made it look really easy. Cool. Thanks, Hugo. Yeah, no, I mean it's like it's like a big testament to like the whole open source Dask community, like all the maintainers, all the contributors, everyone who, you know, all the users, um, as, as well as the engineering team at Coil, right? So yeah, it's uh thanks, Hugo. Appreciate it. Um, cool. So what so if, what if you we... what if you had <laughs> oh, such a leading question? I can see your screen. What if what if you wanted to run XG boost code, for example? And that oh, isn't cool. in your environment. Yeah. That is a leading question. That leads us to our next point. Like we're at the mountaintop, right? We we did something, it was successful, everything kind of worked. And like, now we're gonna see what happens. So let's take this analysis here. Like I, I read in some data, I did a group by some sort of just like, like basic analysis. Let's like take this little step further, just illustrate a pain point that people run into pretty quickly. And we have one question um, before we jump there from yeah. Guy. Um, did James say the red, uh, okay, the communication between workers is something to avoid? And if so, how? Yeah, good question. So, or like good clarifying point. I said it's something It's something to avoid. It's like something you would like to avoid. Like this data transfer can be expensive. It has to happen in a lot of cases because like you need to transfer dependencies. Um, DAS tries to be uh, intelligent about that. So like if there is a dependency, um, uh, like if there's a dependency on, on worker A um, and then the next task depends on that dependency, uh, the scheduler will actually send that task to worker A to compute it because then there's no transfer cost there. Like the dependency already lives on that worker. So that's something to, like Dask tries to be as intelligent and minimize that transfer as, as much as possible. That's maybe more what I would have said. Uh, Dask tries to avoid that where, where possible. Thank you. Great question though. I was not clear about that. Um, cool. So yeah, let's uh, like take this a little step further and try and use our data set now to train an XGBoost classifier. Um, so uh, there's a Dask ML package, which is sort of the scikit-learn equivalent in Daskland. Um, it has a test train split method, which is similar to scikit-learns. Uh, we're also going to use the Dask XGBoost library uh, to do a distributed training of an XGBoost model. So uh, here, like I guess the details here aren't super important. I get some training features and some labels from the data set. Um, I then uh, use test train split to uh, split. Uh, the, the full training set into a testing and training data sets. I've been, uh, you know, define some hyperparameters. Like we're not really going to tune them. It's not, this is more illustrative, just hyperparameters for my XGBoost model. And then let's go ahead and train it. Uh, so let's do that. Um, so I've now executed it. Things are going to start happening on the cluster. There we go. We see some tasks flying by and then I get an error. Um, I get a module not found error. Uh, and I scroll down and I see no module name Dask XGBoost. Um, but then I scroll up and say, uh, I got to here, right? I got past this line. So I have XGBoost installed, or Dask XGBoost. I actually just have Dask XGBoost installed locally. I had that installed on my laptop, um, but it's not actually installed on the clusters. Uh, so this module not found error is not coming from like my local machine. It's coming from the workers on the Dask cluster. Um, and like this is a this is a common problem uh, people run into uh, like one of the first things people run into with distributed computing um, is that they need to like make sure so Dask whenever you execute tasks will take them from your local Python process like here um, on Jupyter Lab it'll ship those it'll serialize those tasks and ship them off to the workers where they run on the workers but if you're using some library locally that the workers don't have the workers then can't they can't import Dask XGBoost on the workers. So you end up getting these error messages. So you need to make sure that whatever things you, tasks you're submitting, uh, those libraries are also installed on, on your cluster, on your workers. Um, this oftentimes involves like, you know, making Docker images, building Docker images, and like maybe having one sort of projects and you end up managing this like whole, like maybe you push them up to Docker Hub and have to manage a fleet of Docker images um, to, to do your analysis. So um, Coiled has sort of taken this on since this is such a common pain point. Um, for for users to try and like make that as smooth as possible um, and, and accessible. So uh, Coiled allows us to create custom software environments that have whatever packages we want in them and then can use them on our workers or we can use them locally as well. I'll kind of demonstrate that here. Um, 
So here I linked to some docs on how to actually build uh, uh, software environments. So much like Dask doesn't, Dask reuses a lot of APIs um, for like things like NumPy and Pandas, Coil tries to like uh, use things that are already familiar to you. So we use uh, packaging standards or not packaging conventions like PIP and Conda uh, that you are probably already using in your day-to-day -day, uh, life. So here I've specified some, some Conda spec um, and how you create uh, software environments with Coiled is this coiled.create software environment function. Um, you give your software environment a name. I'm going to call this thing Dask XGBoost, and then you can pass in some specification. Here I'm saying install these Conda packages. Um, we're going to install Python, Dask, Coil, Dask ML, Dask XGBoost. Those are like the things I've imported so far in this library or in this notebook. Um, and we're going to get this all from Conda Forge. So what That's, this is going to do I have a is quick build a software environment with those things installed in it. Yeah. Um, one may assume that on Coiled Cloud, Dask would be installed by default. Is that not the case? The defaults. So yeah, like I didn't specify a software environment when I created my first cluster. Um, I just said cluster, Coiled cluster in workers equals 10. I didn't say anything <laughs> else. There's a default software environment on Coiled, and it has Dask distributed like NumPy, Pandas, it, it has a few sort of like standard useful libraries for you. Um, and that's why we were able to run, we were actually able to run this first computation up here with, that, with no problem, right? It, it had all those sort of basic packages. It had S3FS, it had Dask installed Pandas. But then when we got out of that a little bit and used a package not installed in there like XGBoost, things kind of fell over. And now we have to create a, our own custom software environment to do that. Yeah, I, I, I think I miss, misspoke that. My, my question was when creating your own software environment, I think it might be a valid assumption that Dask would be installed yeah. in any of your own software environments. But well, that's not the case. You need, if you didn't have Dask- That is not here, the case. You do need to you would, it. Yeah, okay. You need to include right. it. Yeah, because you, you can share software environments for other non-Dask purposes as well. Absolutely. Um, so, yep. yeah, so that we didn't want to enforce that on people. So, yeah, right. I misunderstood your question. You do need to add Dask to this list of dependencies. Perfect. Um, yeah, so this happened actually pretty quickly because I, I, before when I was running through to make sure this notebook worked, had executed the cell earlier. So, like, there were some things that were cached here. This depends. It, this will take a couple minutes. I think it only took, like, uh, you get a bunch of output. Yeah, 22 seconds. That's, like, because things were cached. This will take, when I ran this the first time, it took like maybe two minutes, a couple minutes to actually solve uh, the software environment. What this does under the hood is basically builds a Docker image for you that we manage, uh, uploads it to a uh, Docker repository. And then later on, when you when you are using your clusters, you can just tell us the name of the software environment you want to use. We'll go to the repository, look up the appropriate software environment and use it in your cluster. Um, so yeah, like we're getting all this output that is coming from Docker, but I don't actually, I do have Docker installed locally, but it's not doing anything locally. This is all happening on coiled servers. So you can do this without understanding like the workings of Docker. Like here, you just needed to understand how to con install packages. Um, and yeah, you don't have that. Nothing is running locally here. There's no, there's no Docker build happening here. Um, happening we have a great server. question from Draw. Um, is yeah. there a way to say, install the following libraries with the same versions as this local kernel? Um, draw often has a local version, which is behind and then installing uh, new on remote is incompatible. Yeah, so um, yes and no. Uh, we'll talk about something, we'll talk about coiled install in a second that will like take the remote environment and install it locally. We have some experimental support um, that like you will get experimental warnings when you use it, it's coiled upload, which will scrape your, like if you're in a conda environment locally, it'll scrape it basically can construct that Conda specification and build a software environment with those packages. That's like, it's experimental still. So I yeah. want to say kind of have that support, but like with an asterisk by it, we're still working on it. And, and for me as a data scientist, who's not a software engineer, one way I'd think about doing that, and I think you can correct me completely is I'd probably do something silly like pip freeze and then mm -hmm. write that to a environment. Yeah. TXT or yeah. YAML or whatever it is, and then use that to specify my software environment. Yeah, totally. That's actually what I do. Like, so here we're, we're passing in this dictionary that looks a lot like a Conda environment file, mm. but um, it's mentioned in the docs. I, don't, I hadn't mentioned it yet, but this also accepts Conda environment files. So like you can pass in this like uh, specification here in this dictionary form, or you can just say, here's a like point, give them a path to a Conda environment file and it'll build the software environment there as well. It'll just read in the, the, the contents of it. 
Um, so that's what I, I, I tend to do is locally, I'll use an environment file to go to local environment. I then use create software environment, point to the same conda file and it, it, I'm good to go. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Thanks, cool. James. Yeah, yeah. So like I had no Docker knowledge. Uh, everything ran not locally, not on my machine, on coiled servers. Um, so now let's spin up a cluster that actually uses that software environment. Um, so before I specified when I spun up my coil, my coil cluster, I had in workers equals 10. I still have that. I'm now saying software equals DAX XG boost. That's the name of the software environment up here. When I created it, I called the software environment DAX XG boost. Um, and this is how you say cluster, use that software environment. Um, there are also a bunch of other options that you can use to like specify hardware constraints and things or hardware resources and things like that. Um, I'm just highlighting two of them here. You should go check out the docs if you want to see them all. Um, you can say, I want like how many CPUs you want your worker processes to have, uh, how much memory you want your worker processes to have. Same with the scheduler. Um, you can also say like, if I want GPUs, how many GPUs you know, do I want the workers to have? Um, so here I'm just saying, give my, my each worker, give it four cores, four CPUs, and give it eight gigabytes of memory. That's like, yeah, what's happening. So let's, I should have executed this when I was talking. Let's spin this up, because um, this will take another, another minute or two, because it's gonna now start to provision these resources. Um, Let's maybe go to the, over here, back to the web UI, uh, cloud.coil.io. So yeah, now you can see here's my old, my, my first cluster I spun up. That was just the default one. It's still running. Um, and now I have this pending cluster. This is the one I just started to spin up. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm actually not gonna use this first cluster I spun up anymore. So I'm gonna go ahead and automatically close it down. You can do that in the web UI or in Python. Like if you're in Python land, you can just say cluster.close and that'll close the cluster. Um, or if you want, you can also uh, hit stop cluster here and that will, it, it'll ask me just in case you accidentally hit it. Um, yep, I do really want to stop it and it'll start stop. It'll close down the cluster, deprovision all the resources, everything like that for you. Um, so we aren't quite at feature parity between the Python API and the web UI. The, the Python API is more feature rich than the web UI, but the, we're constantly updating the web UI to get to that feature parity. So, um, you know, eventually you'll be able to launch DAS clusters from the web UI, create software environments from the web UI, things like that. Um, cool. So that's still happening right now. This will take- And a, you can like actually, I, I mean, not, not quite this type of cluster, but you can create clusters from the web UI in our experimental hosted notebooks, right? Oh yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah, I wasn't planning on mentioning that, but since you bring it up. Uh, yeah, there's this notebooks tab here. Oh, my cluster's running now. So yeah, my, my cluster's spun up. So I'll just briefly mention this. If you go to this notebooks tab, we have some like example notebooks here. Um, you can hit launch and it will spin up a uh, notebook for you uh, that has like nice examples. Like there's this Optuna example using Dask Optuna to do some hyperparameterization, hyperparameter optimization uh, with Dask and Coiled. Uh, there's an XGBoost example. There's like a JupyterLab example for getting things all like configured nicely how you might want. Um, so yeah, highly recommend checking those out uh, as well. Um, cool. So I have my scheduler spinning up or my, my cluster spinning up. Um, I got an error message. This is not related. This is from the uh, um, cluster I shut down. Uh, that cluster went away. And like this is an error message saying, hey, that client I had before, I can't talk to that cluster anymore, but that's okay because I already closed it down. I was expecting this. Um, what is a little strange is it says my cluster here is running, uh, but uh, it seems to not be there. Let's uh, hit that. Maybe something bad happened when I, uh, maybe I shouldn't have closed down that cluster right away. Let's see. <laughs> I might go ahead and uh, stop this. And let's try, try again. I'm gonna go ahead and close down this cluster actually first. So now I have no clusters running. Sorry about that, Hugo. That's fine. I mean, this this is a great demo of what, what can happen in any data devops -y software engineering uh, or workflow. Um, yeah, totally. Um, so yeah, we're gonna spin up this cluster uh, with our new software environment we've built and try and rerun like the same exact thing. Um, that we failed to run before because we didn't have XGBoost installed on our cluster. Hugo, are there any questions? Maybe now is a good time to answer those if there are any in the chat. Um, 
Well, we just, Pablo just wrote very cool stuff. I truly do enjoy these webcasts. Thanks for sharing such cool content. So that's awesome. Pavritha gave it a plus one um, and also said she really loves the, the web UI, which is, which is great. Um, I, and thank you. I, I also wanted to state that what just happened, you know, we're debugging something, trying to do it again. Um, the fact that there was a bug, an error, and that happened in two to three minutes, and now we can do it again is, is mind blowing. I mean, this is the type of stuff where you'd set everything up, but it'd take hours. You'd go away, you know, have lunch, maybe go like climb a mountain, um, you know, come, come back the next day and you'd be like, oh, damn, this, this didn't work. Have to do that again. Right. So the fact that, you know, there's orders of magnitude in, you know, in time, time space. Right. Um, I don't know if I've ever used the term time space before in, in the time domain. Right. Space time. Um, exactly. Yeah. Although I feel, no, I'm not going to go down the path of, you know, we're over a hundred years after Einstein's sem like 1905 paper. So, but I, I, I do think the fact that we can do this in, at this at this time scale um, is something that it's really worth recognizing yeah. how empowering that is for da data folk, data professionals, right? Totally. I mean, like, yeah, the, the iteration time is like, like such a big deal from a usability standpoint even, right? Um, yep. Like I remember I would use, anyways, I don't want to talk about it, but like we would, I used to spend a lot of time spinning up like computing resources and just kind of waiting around for like spinning reels to stop spinning. Um, yeah, like yeah. speaking of which, it looks like our cluster has spun up now. Um, oh, look at that. So here's this cluster I spun up. Um, it should be, we should see, yeah, a new running cluster over here. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and connect our client to it. Um, and let's go ahead and get rid of the old dashboard and have the new dashboard for our new cluster flying around. Um, great. And yeah, so let's go ahead and just like redo the same exact uh, computation we were doing before. So here I'm going to read in my data, extract some uh, features and training labels, do a test train split, and then train my XGBoost model. So you can see right now I'm doing the read CSV. Let me refresh this to make it like size right. Um, there we go. Doing my read CSVs. Now I'm doing some other get items. That's probably like getting these uh, columns here. Um, I'm now doing, you'll see some train part has popped up here. That's from Dask XGBoost. It's gonna train like different batches. They're all happening in parallel and, and they're done. There they are. So here's all these trained parts I trained uh, this XGBoost training and voila, at the end, I got out a good old fashioned uh, XGBoost booster class um, or booster object. So it worked. So that's kind of like the, how easy Ooh. it is to get up, uh, yeah, exactly. Get up the, the software environment. Like, you know, I knew how to specify Conda packages. I was able to just execute, create software environment and then easily use it in uh, my uh, cluster. Um, so, so yeah, uh, there are lots of other things that uh, create software environment supports, like it, it supports Conda as we've shown. It also supports PIP. You can give it a list of PIP packages or like in a, a requirements file. Um, it also specifies like if you, um, if you do have Docker expertise and use Docker uh, images in your workflow, you can also specify a container like a Docker image to use as well. Um, so like for instance, here's like a little example. If you wanted to spin up like a GPU enabled software environment, um, you can use the uh, Minicon CUDA from the GPU CI as your like base Docker image. Um, and then you can, on top of that, Conda install a bunch of other packages that are GPU, like uh, that, that work on GPUs from like the Rapids uh, channel. You can install, uh, uh, you know, Dask CUDA, XGBoost, PyTorch. These all work well on GPUs. Um, so that's like one example there. I could do that. And yeah, down here, I'll link to the documentation for how to create more exotic uh, software environments if, if you want to. Um, so so yeah. we've got around five to 10 minutes left, um, but I think we're really on, on, on track actually. So cool. Uh, yeah, no, I think we're the... good. I was worried about having too much material. I think we're actually okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we talked about two of the three things like launching DAS clusters, um, then building software environments. And, and I guess that ties in with using them on DAS clusters. The kind of last thing I wanted to talk about was uh, collaboration and uh, cost monitoring. So um, uh, you can do very important things. Yeah, totally. So like we can create these software environments and, and use them on our, on our clusters. Like I just did, um, coiled ships with a, uh, in addition to the Python API, it also ships with a command line interface. Um, so you can, so here I'm going to use the, uh, little exclamation mark shebang to run like basically terminal commands in Jupyter. Um, so if you're in the terminal, you can run coiled in inspect and then like we just created a software environment named Dask XGBoost. 
Um, so I'm going to run coil to end of inspect task XG boost, remembering like you can type this in the terminal. And it's going to, it's basically going to spit out the specification for the software environment. So here's all those conda packages that I, I uh, specified when I created the software environment. I just use the default container, which basically just has mini conda installed. Um, I didn't say any pit packages and there's also post build. You can like say, run these commands after you've done everything else, like extra sort of ad hoc installation steps. Um, so yeah, so like I can view the software environment. I can use the software environment. I can also do that with other like friends and colleagues who use Coiled. So like for instance, Rami, who's uh, an, uh, head of engineering at Coiled, uh, he, he's Necorus, that's his username on, on Coiled. He has a GPU, a, a software environment named GPU test. So I can do Coiled env inspect uh, Necorus GPU test. And that, that tells me all the things in his software environment, this, this particular one that he created. So you can see kind of similar, he's not using PIP or container. He is do, using Conda, like stuff from Rapids and NVIDIA channels using uh, CUDA toolkit, uh, Pandas, Kupai, things like that. So I can view his software environment like this. I can also use it. I could have, I'm, I'm not going to just in like the um, interest of time, but like just as before, when I said, when I created a cluster and said software equals Dask XG boost, like the thing I just created, I could just as easily say software equals Necorus GPU test or whatever it may be, whatever your friend's software environment is and, uh, and use that there. So yeah, you can collaborate and share software environments as well as like, we're not gonna talk about it here, but you can share basically your cluster settings. Like if you specify a bunch of like fancy keywords and things like that, you can save that and share that with your, your colleagues to have them easily spin up the exact same cluster. Um, so those are kind of different ways in which you can collaborate. Um, on the cost tracking front, um, Quill keeps track of all of the resources being used on both a per person and per account basis. So basically you can create a Coiled account, your own personal account. Um, you can also have an account for like your team. You can, like a, a, sort of an analogy would be on GitHub. Like I have my own personal GitHub account where I have my personal repos. Uh, there's also like the Dask organization where there are lots of Dask repos um, and things like that. You can do a similar thing here, it's sort of the same mental model with Coiled. Um, and this lets you monitor exactly how much you're spending on your clusters and how much everyone on your team is spending. So like maybe I go back to the clusters page you can see here, I can see the current cost rate of my um, cluster. It's so like this cluster has cost me $2 an hour. And this is kind of the integrated cost over time. So far it's costing me 22 cents to run this cluster. Um, you can keep track of that. You also get like this nice historical record of all the clusters you've spun up, how much they cost, some additional data about them. Um, yeah, and so that, that's a nice cost monitoring feature. We also, you can set usage limits per person. So like I can go, like say to, I'm, I'm, these are a bunch of different like uh, accounts I'm a part of. I go to the uh, Coiled account. I can look at people in the account and like I can set resource limits. So like here I am, I can like say right now I have a core limit of 100. Maybe I'm feeling good and I want a core limit of 200. Um, you know, I can do that. I now have a core limit of 200. You can tune these things up and down. Wait, can um, you change my so limits? Like, can you throttle me? Yeah, I can throttle you. No, I don't want you to. I'm asking if you have those privileges. I'm not into that. Oh, I do. I do. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, All right. In the coiled account, not in your personal account though. Yes. Great. Um, so like, like, this is nice. Cause like you can, like, if I, if I wanted to spin up a super expensive cluster, but like, didn't have enough, like if people don't want me doing that, if I try and scale my cluster to a thousand workers instead of 10, you get a nice exception saying like, Hey, you know, you requested core counts above your limits, you know, your limits a hundred, you currently have 42 cores active and like you requested 4,000. So, you know, it's, it, there's nice safeguards like that. And then I just kind of wanted to give a quick shout out. One of my favorite features is Coil Cluster is automatically shut down after 20 minutes of inactivity. So if your cluster is just idle sitting there not doing anything for 20 minutes, it'll automatically shut down. This, this is nice because it prevents you kind of like racking up a big bill if you like accidentally leave your cluster running over the weekend, for instance. Um, you, you can change that by, but, um, like if you're doing an exploratory workload where like you're going to be going in and out for a while doing things, you can set that limit to whatever you want. You can set it to be two hours a day if you want. Um, but by default, it's 20 minutes. So there's some sort of sane default to help you not burn through unnecessary resources. Um, yeah, and with that, that's, that's it. Uh, I, I link here some additional resources. Um, so yeah, like I said, you can join the Coil beta at cloud.coil.io. Um, totally free to use, uh, up to 100 cores uh, at any given time. Um, I link here to the coil docs. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot, obviously a lot more complete information there, including some features we didn't talk about here just because we didn't have time. So like you can launch 
GPU clusters where your workers have access to GPUs. We have in-to-end -in network security. You know, we set up TLS for all of our nodes in our in our uh, cluster. So uh, yeah, along with dot dot many more features. Uh, if you want to, you can join the Coiled Slack community. So uh, Coiled users and Coiled engineers uh, hang out there, and it's like a good place to chat about Coiled and Dask. If you have questions, like the Coiled team is happy to answer those. Although we've had some users answer other users' questions, which is, has been Awesome, and that was like really encouraging to see. That's great. Um, yeah, and then if you run into a bug or have a particular feature request, uh, feel free to open up an issue in the coiled issue tracker, which I went to here. Um, yeah, definitely seeking user input. Like it will help inform you know what we end up building uh, or continue to build. So yeah, and with that, I just want to thank everyone for your time and your attention, and hopefully uh, you have a good sense of like what coiled is, what it does, maybe a, maybe a good sense of how to get started too. So. Thank you, thank you so thank you, so much, James. And yes, thank you, thank you, and thank everybody. We have one question, uh, and another question yeah. from Guy Maskell uh, to use coil. So, yeah, Guy asks to use coil to process data on prem. Must you move the data to say S3, or can you set up access for coil to access your on prem data through a corporate VPN? Um, so yeah, we're like still. Uh building out those features. So yeah, today, uh, I think if you were to spin up things on the, uh, if you were to spin up Coiled today on AWS, it would not have access to all of your local data. Yep. But we are, uh, we have on-prem solutions, things like that as well. So uh, you should definitely get in touch with us if you are interested in, in doing that. And I, one way to do that, I, I would encourage you to uh, join the Coiled community Slack and we can chat about it there and then we can, you know. Yeah, that's a great idea. That somewhere else as well um well that's i just want to make clear today everything we've said happen is happening on friday 23rd of october in australia of course australia lives in the future so it's science thursday and it's thursday october 22nd but in a week guy the answer to your question might be incredibly different um yeah. particularly if you jump into the code community slack and, and and get involved that link i'm actually is in uh the notebook um yep. so i'm actually going to grab that Cold community Slack link and sure. put it in here now. Um, I love that you called this notebook Tour Decoiled, uh, mm -hmm. James. Um, I do want to say, reiterate what James said. Um, we'd, we'd love for you to test out, uh, take Cold for, for a test spin if it's something that would would interest you and join our, join our uh, community Slack um, and give us be brutal feedback because um, we're trying to, trying to build the best stuff possible for all, all of you users at, out there. Um, I'm just going to put this join our coiled community slack in the chat. Um, and also, I just want to reiterate what James said. It was, it was it has been so wonderful to see our slack community grow and to see uh, Dask and coiled users start answering each other's questions as well. Um, and so seeing like seeing a community grow and, and nourish itself and uh, work with us. It's just been so so wonderful. So if that's something that interests you, please join join our community that we're we're, we're building out also. For sure. All right. Thanks once again, James. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, check out uh, uh, cloud.coil.io, and we'll see you soon on a live stream.